we listen closely, we can hear that Paws is no longer being simply beaten, she's being whipped. The biblical word for a whip is a scourge, which today can also mean plague. At about 24 seconds in, Skullface's whip sounds like it's drawn blood from Paws. Paws, get down from there! Do not call me that. I am Pacific Ocean. Cypher gave them all to me. My entire life has but one purpose. To carry out Cypher's plan! Just like how in MGS one character can gain multiple names, the Bible is full of polynomialism. Paul, for example, used to be Saul, a fervent persecutor of early Christianity. But then, after experiencing a supernatural confrontation with the Holy Ghost on the road to Damascus, and three days of subsequent blindness, Saul converted to Christianity and took on the Christian name Paul. Anyway, Paul gets out of being whipped and interrogated by the Romans because he not only knows their customs, he's a natural born citizen. The situation during the story is one of foreign occupation by the Roman Empire, who don't speak the local language. Paul is able to weaken Judaism from within because like Skullface, he straddles both societies. As a convert, he lives in both worlds. Though the law is supposed to be neutral and work non-partially, Paul uses it to play the Romans off the Israelites. He makes the Jews seem like the spitting image of the anti-Semitic stereotype, the murderous, Christ-killing mob, even though that goes completely against the whole concept of Judaism, which is bound by laws. He does this by inciting their hatred in a language that the observing Romans don't understand, and then he speaks to the Romans in private in a tongue and according to customs that the Jews don't understand. In short, the story of Paul, the founder of organized Christianity, who helped turn it against Judaism, is one of betrayals, fake identities, espionage, subterfuge, shibboleths, and code talking. But it is also a story that's transparently counterfeited from elements out of Judaism itself, specifically one of the most important stories in the entire religion, the Jewish exodus out of Egypt, the story known in Hebrew as simply names. But unlike Moses and the Israelites in Egypt who were enslaved and persecuted, in the story of Exodus under the false pretense by the Pharaoh that they represented what's known as a fifth column, a group of traitors from within, Paul and the early Christians really were a fifth column. So there's really no comparison between Paul and the patriarch whose legend he appropriates, Moses. Let my people go. See, the Christians began as a sect of Judaism. Paul is one of the only apostles who did not actually know Jesus before he was crucified. The real analog to the Pharaoh and Egyptians would have been the Emperor and the Romans. But Paul cunningly realized that by splitting Christianity from Judaism, the Roman so-called Gentiles could be converted to it, something that would never happen for Judaism. Because Judaism at the time required adherents to follow certain codified rules like circumcision the Romans considered barbaric. The Kingdom of Israel was once known as the United Monarchy, but after infighting split the land in two, two invading empires took over, first the Neo-Babylonians and then the Macedonians under Alexander the Great. And Alexander the Great paved the way for the wider melding together of the entire Mediterranean region as a salad bowl where many diverse and different cultures and beliefs could coexist that proceeded after his death. But three decades ahead of Jesus' birth, the rise of the Roman Empire ushered in the so-called Pax Romana. This put the Jews in a potentially bad situation, in this new melting pot. If they had given the Romans any reason to crush or exile them, they would be powerless to stop it. Paul played the Jews and Romans against each other, 
stirring up hatreds between them that would last for eons, all to set into motion the eventual victory of Christianity over both potential rivals preemptively. As we'll see, this is more or less exactly what Skullface comes to do to Big Boss and to Zero. Cypher will rewrite the records, and I will vanish from human memory. But the thirst for revenge that I have planted will infest the system! No one can stop it now! But that victory of Paul's would not come until long after his death, just like Skullface. Nearly 300 years after Christ, the Roman Emperor Constantine the Great, a nomial homage of course to Alexander the Great, officially converted to Christianity and the entire empire along with him. I'll try not to get too bogged down here in ancient history, literally, but stay with me. So Constantine came to power in Roman Britannia, in modern day York of England, but he was born in Skullface's neck of the woods, modern day Serbia. At the time he took power following his father's death in AD 306, Rome was only just coming out of its so-called crisis of the third century, which lasted from AD 235 to 284. Beset by civil wars, plagues, and foreign invasions, the Rome that Constantine inherited had to be united if it was to be ruled in peace, if there was to be another Pax Romana. Of course, a pox is a plague. But anyway, the civil war battle that is said to have marked Constantine's ascendancy over the so-called tetrarchy system that had split Rome into quadrants since the third century crisis, each one ruled by a separate emperor, is called the Battle of the Milvian Bridge in northern Rome. On the eve of battle, Constantine is fabled to have seen a vision very similar to the ones experienced by Saul on the road to Damascus which transmogrified him into Paul. The vision was of a sign, a cipher, which read the inscription in hoc signo vinces. With this sign you shall win. And what was that sign? That cipher? An X cut in two by a sort of P. This has been since interpreted as the cipher of Christ, being the two first letters of the Greek word for Christ, spelled like this. And of course, notice that the first letter of Christ resembles somewhat a cross, like the one he was crucified on. The word became flesh indeed. Constantine's forces won that battle, and soon the entire civil war. As for his rival, Maxentius, well, the bridge over the river had been destroyed. Trying to escape, he tried to wade across, or he may have been thrown into the water from his horse, but either way, Maxentius drowned that day. His body was dredged out, after which the corpse was decapitated and then, quote, paraded through the streets for all to see, end quote. Here's what's key. A lot of the story of Constantine the Great only became canonical history well after the fact. He only really converted on his deathbed, in fact. But Constantine recognized that Christianity had power as a lingua franca, a unifying force and so did the people who crafted his legend after his life. As Wikipedia puts it, once Christianity became the state religion of Rome, the emperor's duty became to use secular power to enforce religious unity. Anyone who did not subscribe to Catholicism was seen as a threat to the one true faith. This statue here is of Germanicus, who, prior to Constantine's Christianization of the empire, was considered to be the second coming of Alexander the Great. He died long before Constantine lived. But after Constantine's peace of the church in 313, pagans and non-Christians became the hated enemy. Christians were the ones who defaced Germanicus here, turning him all but overnight from hero and legend to faceless villain. Of course, we see allusions to these legends all over the Phantom Pain, but maybe biggest of all, there's Dr. Evangelos Constantino, whose name means Evangelical Constantine. Of course, this name is a bit of an ironic paradox. Evangelicalism typically refers to a Protestant doctrine which means you get to heaven not by doing good deeds, but by believing in the atonement for original sin by way of the blood of Jesus. And Constantine, as we said, 
represents Catholicism, eons ahead of the holy civil war that brought Protestantism into being. Where I'm going with this is the concept called postmodernism, namely, as Jacques Derrida famously philosophized, there is no outside text. All text, all meaning, derives from some earlier text, and texts, all the way down. It is not authors which create texts in this view, but older texts. Paul created and formalized Christianity by copying Judaism, whereas Constantine reunited Rome by copying both Alexander the Great and Paul. In 1984, O'Brien, Winston's inquisitor, says that the thing that makes the party Ingsos different from all of the totalitarianisms of the past is that they know what they're doing. They have had the time to study the past. Everything, in short, is part of some kind of language, a text of texts. No nation but a mother or father tongue. Or at least that's one text, one way of thinking about it. To quote Solomon the Wise, Ecclesiastes 1.9, What has been will be again, what has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. But it would be mistaken to assume that any identity within MGSV's interpretation of world events, let alone of its own characters, is mutually exclusive. After all, all three of the world's major monotheisms are basically interlinked containing grains of one within the others. We'll get more into that later, and what it has to do with the difference between so-called Western and so-called Oriental or Eastern thought, and other types of thought. But for now, we'll conclude our biblical analysis by pointing out that Paul, using his Roman blood to escape the scourge, subconsciously echoes the story of Passover from Exodus. To force the Pharaoh to let the Jews go out of slavery, God sent ten plagues, or so the legend goes, each more horrible than the last. The final plague was a sort of bioweapon that targeted based on culture and on blood. By marking their doors with the Passover offering, the blood of the lamb, the angel of death's plague passes over the Jewish homes. As Vox explains, the story is, quote, a reminder that even when Jews are oppressed, they are a chosen people and will survive, end quote. Just to show how Christianity takes grains of Judaism but totally inverts their original meaning, Jesus is known as the Lamb of God because his martyrdom, his sacrifice, changed the world. The story of Passover is directly evoked in the book of Revelation, chapter 7, where the Christian faithful, the flock, are called, quote, a great multitude from every nation, tribe, people, and language. They wear white robes. They have come out of the great tribulation, they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb." End quote. Skullface has been literally washed white with blood. His face turned the grayish-white hue of his own very skull. In this way, he resembles a kind of dish that the Torah prohibits cooking. Cooking or, quote, seething the kid, as in goat, sheep, or calf, in its own mother's milk. A kid can also mean the young of a lamb. Chico means kid. And of course, seethe doubles as a term for boiling, but also, quote, intense but unexpressed anger, end quote. See how easy it is to plummet down MGSV's rabbit hole? Let's get back to Chico's fourth tape, but keep in mind the concept of whiteness later on when we talk about Moby Dick and MGSV's interest in the subject of race. You've got comfort. At 32 seconds in, we hear Skullface switch off a tape player of his own. Of course, it's playing a tape, not recording it, but it still shows he has one. We hear the escort throw Chico to Skullface with a shove. 40 seconds, there's the clink of the chain. Paz looks up, perhaps, and sees Chico. Nobody speaks. There's the hiss of the boiler. Then at 50 seconds in, Skullface slaps, not whips, Chico in the face, showing that he is quote unquote deserving of less of a harsh punishment than Paz. Does it hurt? Talk. Does it hurt? He says, then talk. 
offering Chico what in logic we call a material conditional. It sounds rational, in other words, to infer that if he talks, then his pain will end. To assume if Chico hurts, then Chico should talk. But what if I said, if life exists on Earth, then life exists on other planets? We'd have to infer that there is definitely life on other planets, because we know there's life on Earth. To quote Professor Peter Stuber, these paradoxes of material implication are paradoxes in the ancient sense. They are violations of intuition, end quote. They are just two sort of unrelated statements. Chico's intuitions are being violated, as we know. His pain will not end even after he talks. To drive the intuition home, though, Skullface inverts this logical proof. Talk! As if to say, if you don't talk, there will be more pain. You can speak, can't you? Then talk. Now we begin to see how Skullface will weaponize the concept of civility, much as Paul did in the Bible with the Romans against the Israelites. For a third time, Skullface offers a postulate. If you can speak, then you will talk. I know you can speak, so I know you will talk. This is known in logic as modus ponens, i.e. the following three-step logical proof. One, if P, then Q. Two, P, three, therefore, Q. Okay. Okay. So Chico surrenders, meaning he accepts the validity of the desired intuition. Okay means okay, we have a deal. If I talk, then you will stop hurting me. Chico likely hopes this will also lead to pause being saved from pain too. It puts into his unconscious the idea that the only reason Paz is being brutally tortured is she will not talk, will not acknowledge the logical validity, is not willing to make a deal. This is very crucial for Skullface, as for Ingsosh with Winston Smith. The idea that the sufferer is in some sense the cause of all their own suffering. This escapist fantasy hides the awful truth that the sufferer is totally powerless, that morality does not exist if there's no one to defend it, and that everything that happens is in their captor's hands, not their own. So Skullface says, Good boy. Good boy, petting Chico twice. This gesture unconsciously recalls petting a dog, but also Chico patting himself in tape one, when he tried to snap himself out of fear and doubt, back into the so-called true reality that he's okay and he's gonna save Paz. It was a powerful fantasy then, it's a powerful fantasy now. So notice that before Skullface actually asks Chico a thing, he sort of introduces himself like a gentleman. Your boss and I go way back. His tone is conversational, bordering on friendly. It's as if to say, see, it's not so bad. It was for your own good to talk to me. I'm a man of my word. It seems to prove that Skullface is trustworthy. He upheld his end of the bargain. Chico talked by which I mean he said okay and opened the door to a conversation and now Skullface has stopped hitting him. Your boss and I go way back. Don't count on him coming to rescue you. This line is loaded with subtext. It seems to Chico as though Skullface is giving him privileged insider information. He's also telling Chico what deep down the boy already likely believes. That just as Big Boss didn't come to rescue Paz, he won't come to rescue Chico now that he's been captured. If Chico thought Big Boss was, he probably would have never stepped in to save Paz himself. If you're a real soldier, you'll find your own way out. Now this line will be echoed in the actual opening of Ground Zeroes. You're a real man now, soldier. Another use of logic and repetition to mislead Chico's intuitions, as well as the audience's. Chico hears this as the reverse postulate. If you find your way out, you will have ipso facto proven you are a real soldier. But that isn't necessarily true, is it? Notice the phrase, own way. He's actually saying that Chico should betray Big Boss as an act of self-respect and manly heroism. 
Chico found, or so he thinks, his own way in, didn't he? I made it ashore. I'm in Cuba. Security looks lighter than I thought. Skullface lets the words linger in the air, so they'll sink in. Your own way out. <sighs> but don't bother trying to escape. <sighs> then he says, but don't bother trying to escape. Like he's just doing Chico a favor, helping him become his own man, giving time-saving advice, like who? Like a big brother. A theory that will spend this entire investigation putting forward is this that Skullface is trying to make the world one by making all of its various sides sick with the same virus, so to speak. That virus is loss, specifically the loss of truth, which triggers an insatiable yearning for it. You too have known loss, and that loss torments you still. You hope hatred might someday replace the pain, but it never goes away. It makes a man hideous inside and out. Wouldn't you agree? <laughs> Even this very investigation demonstrates that none of us are immune from this hunt for a truth we'll never have, this sickness. Skullface offers Chico the only thing resembling this unobtainable truth that's possible here, an apparent way out, on his own terms. It is now I have to bring up a very controversial subject that very well could result in something bad, both for me and you. So I'll give you a chance to stop watching now, because I'm about to talk about a very taboo topic indeed, namely, Chinese totalitarianism. And all I knew is dead. I know how you feel. I've felt that. Remember when I pointed out that we can hear what sounds like Skullface stabbing his prisoner in the secret recording? Well, I have no proof, but I think it may not have been a knife at all, but what in China they call the small white dragon. It's not metal, it's a white plastic tube about an inch in diameter and eight inches long. The Chinese authorities use it to mutilate and torture thought criminals, like, for example, Muslims or practitioners of the small religious sect Falun Gong. This is likely why Chico winds up with that chest wound. Uh, in a later bit of tape, it sounds like his captors use it to insert electric batons into it and shock him. Again, just like the Chinese allegedly do in their own mini little Guantanamo bays. I bring them up now because if there's an armed gunman standing by all the while as Skullface re-educates the two prisoners, it recalls an infamous formulation by Mao Zedong of quote, Wu, the military, or force of arms, and Win, literature, culture, words, end quote, from We Have Been Harmonized, page 82. Mao once said that political power grows out of the barrel of a gun, but the China of today, under the technocratic iron rule of Xi Jinping, uses AI and big data digital tech to create a police state and re-education society the likes of which the world has never seen. Tellingly, Skullface remarks to Chico at the opening of Ground Zeroes, no more war games, you're a real man now, soldier. Xi Jinping is quoted as having said upon the collapse of the Soviet Union, what they lacked was a real man. In fact, while exfiltrating with Chico in Ground Zeroes, he'll say he wants to start life over as an hombre nuevo. In Spanish, speaking Christianity, this phrase conjures to mind the notion of Jesus' rebirth, of evangelicalism, and the rebirth possible to everyone via baptism. Baptism in water, like Snake, Chico, Kaz, and the Medic, if he exists, ironically all undergo. But in the tongue of communism, the new religion, the new man was the new Soviet man. Homo Soveticus, uh, as Masha Geshen called it. Communist 2.0 states like China today, really the only one actually, 
practice this 20th century notion of using brainwashing and re-education to completely transform the human being with high technology and total information control, including, of course, language control. The word brainwashing, in fact, derives from an originally Chinese phrase, Zhi now, and I apologize because my pronunciation on a lot of this is probably wrong. Brainwashing is precisely Skullface's goal here. First Chico and Paz, then the entire world. And this is for reasons and uses techniques that we'll get to, don't worry. Another important China connection is that depicting skulls of any kind there is strictly forbidden. But maybe the biggest connection of all to communist regimes, both new and old, has to do with the question of truth itself, something I touched on a minute ago. Simply put, the way that MGSV at large resists a definitive and objective account of its truth is precisely the way it goes about rejecting or rebelling against totalitarianism of all stripes. The Soviets believed, as Ocelot says while interrogating Huey, that facts and truths are objective. In Arthur Kessler's Darkness at Noon, this point is made very clear. The Soviets were able to commit such unspeakable acts of depravity because they followed a militarized version of Hegelianism meaning they believed history itself was a directed process with an objective final evolution point, a final end. The concept never be game over directly rejects this Hegelian idea of an end of history and of a last man, as does the quote by Friedrich Nietzsche, facts do not exist, only interpretations. Nietzsche himself was very worried about the possibility of a last man, not as a final end point, but as something that would be imposed, shackled upon the human being. The Chinese communists today speak of truth and the rule of law strictly as euphemisms. Arguably no regime in human history personifies the notion from MGS of patriots controlling the flow of information more so than the Chinese. As Kai Strittmayer writes in We Have Been Harmonized, there is a legend in China about the great Yu, quote, the mythical ancient emperor who tamed a huge river. The great Yu learned from the catastrophic experiences of his predecessors by relying on a combination of damming and channeling, stopped the flow in one place and let it go in another. That brought him success, and according to the Communist Party School's magazine Seeking Truth, even more necessary was public opinion. Free speech, like flowing water, is a natural form that requires clever taming." End quote. The idea of learning from history to make your tyranny and your control more complete is a major theme in Orwell's 1984. We Have Been Harmonized makes extensive reference to Orwell's legendary anti-totalitarian novel, showcasing how China, quote, steals its enemies' words like democracy and rule of law to make them China's own. Words like elections and sacred right to vote and freedom lose all meaning. They have been discredited. In this way, citizens are inoculated against subversive influences. When they come into contact with other worlds, a normal part of life in our globalized age, they, the Chinese, will not become infected by dangerous words that represent dangerous ideas. This perverted language makes the population immune." End quote. In China today, not only chicos and pauses, but their lawyers are tortured with, quote, electric shocks, burns, maltreatment of sexual organs, and sleep deprivation, end quote. Simply being an evangelical Muslim or Christian, meaning one who's trying to spread your faith, can be enough to wind you up in one of their detention centers, locked away entirely from the eyes of the world. And it is this same communist party that speaks always of truth and facts and laws, the same as the Soviets and to some extent the Americans did and still do. Three totalitarianisms all wearing slightly different faces, just like in Orwell's novel. If we are unable to pin down MGSV precisely, we have to understand that it's part of how the game has innovated what Orwell called the totalitarian fiction of the future, one in which the author or creator themselves fade into the background and where the truth is forever lost, like a cipher once you lose the only remaining decoder key. Like Melville's Moby Dick, which only mentions a philosopher in the most negative of terms, MGSV wants to challenge the rudimentary assumption, the faith in capital T truth as something we can ever know or obtain completely, especially if it's from a so-called authority. This has to do with the idea of pedagogy, which we will look at soon enough. Nietzsche believed the human will to truth is in reality often, if not always, a will to power. A desire to master and control the world, not to access it in of itself, which at any rate he believed to be both impossible and proof as an idea of human vanity. 
Nietzsche wasn't even really sure if truth was all that worth accessing, actually, considering that an obsession with truth could lead one to nihilism. Once you realize that things don't really work out in reality the way that we want them to, or maybe are programmed to by our brains. The genius of MGSV is that it shows that, like Nietzsche also arguably believed, this lack of a total truth isn't such a bad thing. The ideas and interpretations we come to are in some sense more pure, more perfect than anything in the game world in of itself, as much as the real world for that matter. And in that way, MGSV suggests the very thing that enslaves us to the church of truth could also be the very thing that sets us free, our imaginations, our minds. Acceptance of the blank space, as Kojima called it, the blank space of MGSV is the only way to reconcile its epistemic and wider philosophical dilemmas. Everything I have to say from here on out must be understood as merely one imperfect, unavoidably flawed attempt to fill that space, that gap, without which MGSV would fail to be the artistic masterpiece it truly is. One that is necessarily, as a form of anti-totalitarian art, intentionally incomplete. Its completeness is in its incompleteness, so to speak. Like knowledge of good and evil brought by eating Eden's apple, one isn't possible without the other. Truth and illusion are joined at the hip, so to speak, like Venom Snake and Big Boss, forever impossible to disentangle. Thank mm -hmm. you.